traditional owners of the land in which we're gathered today. So for, for us here in the Gladstone Regional Office, um, that would be the Tarabong Honda people, the Garang, Garang Garang and Bayali people. And in the, the local language, the traditional owners called this place Yana, which means the place of shells. So I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. So um, thank you for being here and joining us today. Um, Marie is going to share with us about uh, the, the ones and spectrum. And of course, uh, this whole program came about as a result of the Australian Early Development Census data that was released in 2018, and which showed us that we had increased levels of vulnerability here in Gladstone. What's this? And, uh, What's that, that I presented. No, I'll have to do that. I don't want to listen to Elise. Alrighty, <laughs> I think that's work. Sorry about that. Um, yes, so uh, that data set, I've presented the data, the results of the Australian Early Development Census uh, to the community back in, would have been 2019. And at that workshop, um, I sort of said to everybody who was there, what what would we like to do about that? Um, and and what, can, what can we do? So we actually formed a group at that time, which then uh, morphed into the Gladstone Response to Outcomes for Wellbeing. And it's a group, a very varied group. Uh, we have people from schools, from early childhood centres, from community organisations, state government, um, all over. And really just anybody who's interested in contributing to that reduction of vulnerability prior to children starting school. And that is how these wonderful professional development sessions came about, was about how do we get the information from our wonderful local professionals to our wonderful educators and teachers on the ground so that they can use that to support children and families. So without further ado, I will uh, turn off my camera and hand over to the lovely Marie. She does have her um, presentation up. Can I just ask, I can see you, Tina Greer. <laughs> can you see the presentation? No. Okay, so we might have to reshare that. And um, we'll wrangle these tech situations. Oh. Do you need sound at this point or not? No. No. Has that, oh, yes, yeah, so that red line means they will, can I, will I need sound though? Do I need sound? Should I have it now? No. Okay. Will I need to change it for later? Yeah. When do you get to when? Right, yeah. Right, yeah. Right, yeah. Okay. So hello everybody. Um, I know you can see me. I am not able to see you. So this is a little bit strange presenting to um, a PowerPoint slide. So hello and welcome. It is so wonderful to have you with us this afternoon and thank you for giving up your precious time to be able to um, att attend the session with us. I do hope that it is um, worthwhile for you. I am sure that many, much of the information that I give you this afternoon, you are already aware of and you are already doing, uh, and that is really exciting. So for no, if nothing else, it is really about consolidation and reaffirming that you are on the right track and celebrating the great work that you are already doing. Okay, so we will kick off. I don't mind if you would like to um, ask a question throughout the session. We do have some time at the end of the session where I have left a, a little period of time available for some questions or some comments about the session. Um, so um, we will kick off then. Um, I see that people are waiting in the lobby and Linda has just left. So if you could just hang on a minute, I'm just going to slip over to the other computer and let them Okay, sorry about that. I think they're already in. Okay, so I will. Linda has already done an acknowledgement of country, and um, I affirm Linda's um, acknowledgement. What I would also like to add to the acknowledgement of country this afternoon is, in the spirit of our young people and our little ones who are um, in our schools today, they are our emerging leaders, and we play a, an amazing role and, and a great, greatly privileged role. In, in assisting them to reach their potential. Um, we know our, we hope that moving forward that we continue to celebrate um, their lives and that we are playing an important role in influencing them to move forward. Um, just some housekeeping before we start. 
If you have your mic on, would you mind just checking and making sure that it is mute? Sometimes when we're joining and we're a little bit late and a little bit flustered, we actually forget that our mic is on. So um, if you wouldn't mind just checking that for us, that would be really wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, so just kicking off, the learning intentions for today are really about focusing on a strength-based approach. Again, I am sure that these are the things that you are already doing in your centres and in your early childhood environments. Um, what I would also love to do is just broaden the knowledge of resources amongst us and strategies that are available to support our little ones and their families as we move forward. Um, and the final learning intention is to just strengthen an understanding of evidence-based practices for little ones with autism. Um, I think it will become evident as we move through the sessions today, there is an amazing amount of research happening in for autism in this space at this point in time and will continue to do so. So those things are really exciting for us because they are the things that change our future. Um, the other thing I think that is also really cool is the voice of students and the voice of individuals with autism. Um, a, a preferred way of conducting research these days is to actually have individuals with autism who are participating in the research and that just gives us some amazing perceptions and some amazing information that cannot be um, cannot be copied in any other way. So just having them participate has really given some great insights into that. Uh, first of all, just a little bit about me and where I come from. So I am the same as many of you, um, perhaps I'm employed by the Department of Education. With the Department of Education um, in Brisbane is the Autism Hub. So the Autism Hub was, I guess, started as an initiative um, as a result of the Deloitte report around 2016. Um, and the Autism Hub um, and Reading Centre are based in um, Merton Road in Wollongabba. Uh, it is a statewide advisory service. Um, it is principal learning for all educators so that uh, we are now working with um, little ones from early childhood settings as well. So that's really exciting for us. We also offer workshops and um, connections for parents. We try to um, have some innovative collaborative projects with um, sometimes with individuals, um, other principal advisors, but also just looking at some of the logos that you see on the bottom of the screen. We are also um, affiliated with these organisations as well, and they are endorsed partners by the Department of Education. So that's uh, really exciting for us um, to be able to um, stay abreast of, of current, current research, current initiatives, and to get some amazing things continuing in our spaces for our little people with autism, but also our older students as well. Um, I guess, as we know, little ones aren't little for very long um, and they do move into the education setting and then they move into our community. So they are individuals in our communities far longer than they are little people in early childhood settings and our students in our schools. So part of what we are doing together is to create um, a better understanding for individual, individuals with autism and that ultimately creates greater, greater cohesive, uh, vibrant communities as well where diversity is celebrated. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I am a principal advisor for autism, so based in the CQ region. There are two of us in this region and there are seven regions across the state of Queensland and there are two principal advisors for autism in each of those regions. So that is really exciting. Um, while we are, um, I guess, connected with Central Office and the Autism Hub in Brisbane, we are sent to the, we are based in regions as well to just make sure that we can keep our finger in the pulse, or on the pulse across the region. We have a level of expertise in the area of autism and we also, I guess, have a brains trust in the other individuals who are also focused in this area. So that's really exciting for us. Um, our main role is basically to build capabilities of whole school and early learning communities to um, uh, create better futures for ourselves and for our kids. And we also pay a pivot, play a pivotal role in connecting educators and parents with local information, advice and support. Um, you can be assured that any information that comes from the Autism Hub or any information that is presented by the Principal Advisors for Autism in any sessions or any conversations that we have is endorsed and is reliable and is, and is an evidence-based practice. Um, we, while we employ a strength-based focus, it is also really important that we um, provide information that has been um, replicated through research and is endorsed um, in that way. Um, if you haven't visited the Autism Hub website, this is a website that is open for everybody and I would encourage you to check it out when you have a moment or two. You will find some of it to be relevant um, when you are working with little ones and some perhaps not, but I think that 
you know, whatever we, whatever information we can access, there will be snippets of, um, of cool stuff that you would find helpful, I'm sure. I'd like to draw your attention to the search bar at the top, the little white bar that you can see at the top. A little bit later in the session, I'm going to introduce you to evidence-based practices. If there is something that you would like to investigate or like to explore, if you simply pop um, your search into there, it will generally come up. So if there is an evidence-based practice that you would like to know more about, if you type it in there, it will take you to that. Um, the Autism Hub also has a Facebook page, which is really exciting if you are on Facebook. Again, the information on there is valid and sound and um, confirmed by research. Um, they have a commitment at the Autism Hub that, that uh, any posts placed on there will be responded to in within 48 hours, so that's also really cool. And I think the last count, there were over 13,000 followers who were um, uh, using the Autism Hub Facebook page as a source of information uh, and information sharing. Okay, um, the most recent, uh, and I guess this has come about with when we talk about our young people with autism and advocating for themselves, just talking about um, getting some clarity around the autism language. So the Autism Hub has released this uh, slide to just clarify how we refer to young people with autism. So the autis Autism Hub prefers to use the term autism. Um, when we are using the term autism spectrum disorder, we are using that in by terms of a medical diagnosis, and that would be probably more in a clinical field or more with a paediatrician who is using that diagnosis. It's not how we refer to individuals with autism in, in everyday conversations. We also recognise, however, that many people with autism, particularly adolescents, um, are now encouraging uh, the, to be referred to with the classification first rather than identity. So they prefer to be regarded or referred to as autistic. Um, and this is something that we celebrate and acknowledge as well. So. Um, we on the Autism Hub and with the Department of Education, we use people first language um, and we do that across the areas of disability or disorders. So it's just important um, to acknowledge what's currently happening in this space. So that's quite exciting that um, many individuals are proud of who they are and, and how they are. Um, and I guess the other thing, I guess the disclaimer there, probably not so much for little ones, but most, most certainly for our adolescents. If you're not sure of how to, how to refer to them, just ask, just ask how they would like to be and then we have no wonderings. So just a little bit about autism. It is a lifelong condition first noticed in early childhood, um, usually around the age of 12 to 18 months. Um, it's, and it is usually parents who are the first people to notice that something is a little unusual about their baby. Um, it is a lifelong condition, but we do know that the impact will often diminish over time as individuals obtain additional skills, additional ways of working in the world, additional ways of understanding and lived experience will also give them knowledge to understand how to cope with specific situations. Um, there are at this point in time no cause or factors can be attributed to autism. We do know however that vaccinations is not one of them. Um, even though we are still sometimes um, have conversations with people who um, are connected with individuals who believe that their child or their niece or nephew um, was impacted through vaccinations. It is not something that has been endorsed in the thousands of studies and researches that have that has been conducted as a result of that. Um, but just interesting to know that 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 belief is still um, still still around in some spaces. Um, autism knows no ethnic or racial um, uh, back predominance. Um, it is not connected with um, socioeconomic or demographic um, notions. Um, we do know that in some spaces it may be underrepresented simply because there may be cultural or implicit bias that um, diagnoses young people for with other conditions rather than autism. But certainly, again, research in this area is continuing and we will um, watch this space to see what happens next. Um, interestingly enough, uh, autism is a neuro neurological condition, but the way it is diagnosed is through behavioural behavioral aspects, and they are in um, rigid and repetitive thinking and social social um, communication. So this slide that you see here is the traditional version of autism. Um, when we have when we talk about a spectrum disorder, we say you know um, oh, they're a little bit autistic, or the impact is 
quite small on their world, right through to an individual who may also have an intellectual disability and may have some really significant impacts of, of autism in their world. Um, so as a linear perspective, that was how we thought of autism. Fortunately, we have many individuals who have autism who are now speaking up and saying, hang on a minute, that doesn't actually describe how I am. I have autism and that's not how I see myself. So this is really helpful for us because it helps us be able to better understand, but it also helps us to be able to pass this information on to others. So um, Burgess, the uh, lady who um, drew the graphic in the last slide, she has actually um, developed um, some graphics here that you can see on the slide in front of you. So she talks about um, it more as a, a, a spiral or a, a circular kind of effect. And she says that she could place herself on the dots that you can see on the, on the um, uh, visual to the left. So she believes that moving um, more outward to the um, slide you are less impacted by that condition, and when you are closer, you are more impacted. Um, we also know that environment plays a really big part in this, and I think if um, any of us who believe that we are fairly articulate in a great situation when it's a one-on-one, -on -one, let's go to a rock concert and try and have a conversation with someone. So we can see how in that environment we don't feel we're getting a message across and we don't feel effective. So it's very similar how, it, how the impact of the environment can often um, affect how a young person or an individual with autism is functioning. And that would be the same for our little ones specifically. I guess the difference with our little ones is often they are not able, they don't have the language to tell us that. So in many ways, we're kind of guessing or trying to um, limit, limit things that, or influences it so that we can work out what's happening in that space. Um, so a little bit of research now. Um, I've, I've, the image on the left I have I discovered many years ago and it continues to intrigue me. So um, I guess you can work out the individuals in the clip on the left looking at the control group, so the people who um, used eye gaze in research to determine where they are looking, they did not have autism. Okay, so we can see they're looking at eyes, nose, mouth, and that's where the eye gaze was monitored and tracked. But when we look on the other side, so individuals with autism, the tracking of their eyes, eye gaze is very, very different. So when we think that individuals are looking at us and developing expression or whatever, or understanding expression, that may actually not be the case. Um, we often see misinterpretations of emotion. We often see uh, misunderstanding with language and communication. We often see little ones with autism who are not able to look at our face, but um, are still listening to us. This research study was done in 20, 2002, so that's 20 years ago. Um, but I just, I guess I just wanted to pop it in just as a, just as a, a, a counterpoint, I think, or just something to reflect on. Um, and just to, as a consideration that while we think our, our young people may be aware of what's happening and looking at our, our the important parts of our, our face to um, communicate with, I guess it then clar provides additional clarity to um, the social and reciprocal communication difficulties that many of our little people have. The photo on the other side, um, I think is just, it just says so much. So there's the eye gaze, the connection that that little one is having with, with um, his or her parent, I think is really powerful. And just being mindful that little ones with autism may not have that and may not have had that. So this is the thing I can't find. So okay. I have to tell you, I have to, um, oh, ASD detect. Yes. Would you? Yes. Would you okay. okay. So I'm a little bit excited now because I was trying to find the, the slide to show you this and I will find it. Um, if you could maybe give me a minute, what I will do is close this PowerPoint and show you what I was looking for, if you could just bear with me. But I guess this is a continuation of current research. We are so very excited about the things that are happening in our world for our individuals with autism and it is really exciting. So um, this app is something that has been released. It is, um, I guess, groundbreaking in many ways. We know that early intervention is paramount and so very important for our, our little ones with autism or any disorder. We know that early intervention is a very important aspect of development and meeting milestones. Um, but we also know that for our... Is that it? Um, I'm not sure. Transforming the early detection of autism. Maybe. It does have an app that's got a little clip, but I'll now oh, eye contact. Yes. So, so basically what what this we also know with the importance of early intervention, we also know that while um, there are signs for our little people with autism, 
They are often not formal, formally diagnosed until around four, even though we can see changes or differences around 18 months to two years. So the word, the word I guess, for researchers and people who work in that space is that it would be really great if we could have an extra two years to sort to sort some things out. So what I'm going to do now, if you will please just bear with me, I'm going to um, take a brave step and shut down my computer, shut, close up my... So I'm on the page, but where is the video? Uh, I'm not sure, so... Oh, is that is that it there? Well, that's the page. Did you do autism to ASD? Yeah. Oh, I found it. Okay. So if you've ended show, I will share my screen. Okay. Okay. Oh, right. So that it's all happening here. That will work. Okay. <laughs> so, so hang on, hang on, sharing. everyone. Believe me, this will be well worth the wait. Mm -hmm. This is very exciting. Okay, I'm stopping sharing and I'm handing over to Linda. So what, what Linda is going to show you in a minute, and I will just talk with this. So And these this, individuals oh, are our friends, friends our families, our colleagues, our neighbours. And autism doesn't discriminate. It affects all classes and races equally. But what we do know is that autism does affect more boys than girls. So that with every one boy, um, with every one girl... Okay. Okay. Perhaps, perhaps, there's no picture. Perhaps not. No, okay, so um, you can finish your sentence. Okay. And, um, but it, it, it is, it, it's a little clip and it's got a little girl and a little boy on it. This one? Uh, were you just playing that? No, that was another one. Children background. typically use eye contact to share their attention, oh. interests, and feelings, and also to ask for things. They use eye contact with both familiar and unfamiliar people. That's it. Children. Okay. Right, all right, so it's on. I think that's it. I don't. It's on the screen. If you did, you want to do a bit more? Sorry, the intro? yeah, I'm sorry, everybody. Um, okay, I don't know that that is. I don't know that that is actually it. Oh, anyway, um, I will continue. Now I'm very sad. <laughs> oh, so I need to share. Sorry, everyone. As you as you are probably worked out, technology is not is not my friend at times. Um, If you can oh. find the clip, it, it, it is on that. It is. It means it, that's the only one I can see there is that that one. 12 months, eye contact. Yeah. So it goes for two minutes and 40 seconds. I don't, I don't think it's that. I don't think there that. was a little baby and there was that picture. Yeah. No, that's all right. That's I do apologise, everyone. Um, oh, am I sharing? Oh, I'll oh, stop. stop. Sorry. Stop sharing. No, I don't stop. You can just go share. Show. Sorry, everybody. Oh. So that's sharing. No, it's not. No. And then you split it to the wrong thing. Okay. Okay. If you do have an opportunity to check out the Olga Tennyson. Um, uh, School of Autism Research Centre. There are some amazing things happening in that space. There is also some research um, on social and communicative adaptions. So it's a SACS research. So what they have done in Tasmania, they have trained a number of um, early childhood health workers. Um, it, is, it is training that they have done with them where they are able to um, recognise specific aspects of a little person who is presented to them when they're doing the health checks. And the reliability of that um, checklist and process has been uh, certainly replicated and is very has a very strong correlation between little people being formally diagnosed with autism at a later date. So those things are groundbreaking for us. For those of us who may not be aware, the current, the current um, preferred model or gold standard for diagnosing autism is the ADOS, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. So that takes about an hour. And then there is the... Uh, the ADR, ADR, the ADIR, so the Autism Diagnostic Inventory Revise, that takes probably two and a half hours to talk with a parent about. So those things are, while they are regarded as gold standard, they are very time consuming. So this current research, which is, um, I guess, um, receiving a lot of positive feedback and affirmation through follow-up research is also really exciting for us in that we can diagnose um, or pick, pick our little people for early intervention very quickly. Um, can I also just say, 
I'm sure that you heard that lady talking on the autism on the Latrobe website. I just need to do a disclaimer. So that clip is probably quite old. Um, she was talking about more boys with autism. There are more boys than, than girls with autism. We are actually finding that that is now questionable. So again, research moving forward all the time and watching this space. There are certainly more boys diagnosed with autism than girls, but we actually are now fairly confident that the ratio between boys and boys and girls with autism is probably more closely um, more, more close. Um, we also know that standardised testing for our diagnostics, such as the ADOS, was used with boys, so it was based on males. So already the girls are going to be, I guess, in, in that way behind the eight ball because it wasn't standardised to females. We do know that the presentation between males and females is very different. Um, and we often find that little girls who have been diagnosed with autism are often those that, that play out. You often see them first through their behaviour. Um, girls with autism tend to be able to mimic more readily and follow what other girls are doing so they don't stand out in the crowd and we don't notice them. When they play, they appear to be playing as we would, um, as, as a regularly developing little girl would be playing. But if you ask questions about what's happening in that space or why, why is that little girl sitting there, why is that doll sitting there, what are they doing, there is no um, creative or imaginative connections in that space. Um, so, yeah, a very interesting area. Uh, but if you have some time, please check out uh, the La Trobe University and you might be able to have a look and find the, the app. The app is called ASD Detect and there is a clip on the website that just shows um, a little one that was diagnosed with autism at a later date and um, it was about use, the use of gesture and eye contact. So the little one was diagnosed with autism, did not have gesture or eye contact. The little boy, um, the other two children that were profiled on that video, used nodding, so gesture, gestural pointing, nodding for yes, pointing, touching themselves and using gesture in, in a number of different ways. So in those regards, they would um, not make the cut for being um, diagnosed with autism. Okay, so moving right along, moving from that research to this research is our evidence-based practices. You may be aware of these evidence-based practices in your space. Um, they came about many years ago with a doctor called Archie Cochran. So he was a doctor in a hospital in the States and um, started to become really concerned when he saw lots of practices that were not what he believed to be evidence-based. So he actually started a movement, which was really exciting. So it started, it started in medical, but then moved out to other things. Um, so the evidence-based practices that you see in front of you, are there are 28 here, and they are the 28 evidence-based practices that are uh, supporting our young people with autism. They are, there are only 28. Um, they are for us, they are for us to use. This one and this one are the only two in that list that require additional training to um, use with a, a little one with autism. Of course, the music mediated intervention is going to need a music therapist who completes additional training to be able to administer that uh, therapy. And the sensory integration or is, is also um, delivered by a therapist who has additional training. But when we look at all the other um, evidence-based strategies there, they are for us to do. The three that are most important, prompting reinforcement, we are doing that every day. The one who is the, the third one that has gained a lot of research at the moment or the, over the last few years is video modelling. So that's the second last one on the right hand side. So video modelling is one that has garnered a lot of research and it is standing its own. So while there has while it has attracted a lot of research, it continues to replicate positive results. So that is a really exciting space for us. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so the other disclaimer is we know that evidence-based practices work. I often hear when I visit schools, we've tried that and it doesn't work. I guess I just need to say it is about the process that is in being implemented then. It is not the product. The product has been proven through rigorous and repeated research. If it is not working, it's about how we are implementing it in that environment. It needs to be done consistently. Everyone needs to be on the same page using the same scripts, the same words, or however you are doing it so that it is the same across environments and it needs to be done with consistency. And then when we have all those elements there, they are what we need for success. Okay, I'm going to take you now to the Autism Hub. So moving from the evidence-based practices that we saw, this is um, a guided FBA tool. Now, a disclaimer here, this is not 
an FBA, a functional behaviour analysis that we use that is um, uh, delivered by a, a guidance officer or someone who has done specific training. This is for us. This is a, a, a mini FBA that is for everyday behaviours in everyday environments, in our classrooms, in our early childhood centres. Okay, it is for us to use and enjoy. When you go to this website, you will see uh, the box section at the top will be blank and you will be encouraged to respond to a series of questions. Each time you populate a question, it will move you to the next box and you will answer those questions there. It is generic, so um, we, you know, it is not individualised, but if you do it with an individual in mind, it will be, you will, it will be helpful. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes to complete. When you have completed that and, and press export to PDF, this is what you will see. The links at the bottom of this page will remain live and they will assist you in um, thinking about some procedures or some strategies that you might be able to implement for your little one. Um, if you download it, keep it as, don't, don't print it off because if you've downloaded it, these will stay live and you'll be able to have links to them. Um, that's just a closer view so you can have a look. Um, I think in many of them you will see visual supports. Visual supports are our go-to. We encourage you to use them in any way that you can in the classroom, on the playground. Um, we've got video modelling in the desired behaviour there. But again, um, very exciting stuff. So I will talk a little bit more about this later on. This slide, I think, I guess I just wanted to show it to you because we talk when we talk about our social emotional learning, it just creates some links for us to look at our evidence based practices to see how we could actually use some of them to assist with social emotional learning. And this is really, really important for our little ones in our early settings who are just who are just working out their space in the world and how they can how we can help them optimize how that how they move and what they think and what they do and have lovely days in their setting and just enjoy who they are. Um, I think that you will be able to see the links here um, with this. I just thought it was a really exciting thing. Um, some of the things like power cards, if you need some more information about that, I can give it to you. So a power card basically is um, just a way of, of getting young people to be engaged. So let's just say a little person loves a, loves firefighters. So it might be firefighter Sam says, put on my shoes and socks, do up my laces and go, go, go. So it might be you might use that for a little person who's finding it difficult to get dressed in the morning. Uh, might be someone who's interested in Star Wars, but just using um, some of those wordings to um, be able to create a little a little spiel that they can say to get things moving. Okay. Um, so when we after we have looked at the Autism Hub um, FBA tool, I'm encouraging you to have a look at the Affirm. Um, Linda has the links to all of these sites that you are looking at at the moment, so please don't panic and please don't think you need to have notes because you will have links to all of these. So the Affirm, again, is an evidence-based um, uh, site. Again, we endorse it through the Autism Hub so you know that the information you receive on here is valid and timely and has been endorsed by research. Um, when you start looking at some of your evidence-based practices, you can go to this site and have a look. It will give you some information on how you can implement that. The, if there is data collections, they will be there. It's basically a one-stop shop for everything you need. So if you decide to look at um, reinforcement, for example, the example that you see there, that's given you a list of what you need or what you're going to be using. Um, it will also give you some of the reasons why. Why is reinforcement so cool? Where does the evidence come from? How do we know it works? How is it being used? And the next slide, which is also really cool, it shows us what years or what age groups it is effective for. For some of them, it works across the board, right from little people right through to high schoolers. So when you see this, yes, it's going to work. So. Um, just being mindful of that, we know that that would work in this setting. And we, we use our reinforcement every day in every way. So just thinking about our positive reinforcement, we know that it is an evidence-based strategy. If you're not sure of how to use it or if you want to collect data, if you go into the Affirm module, it is free to join, so please don't worry. Um, once you log in, you will have access to those things um, and, and access to those resources. It is well worthwhile and it is a great way to, if you're going to establish or focus on a particular strategy, that everyone can use the same, uh, sing from the same song sheet. 
So I guess now just coming to some strategies that might be helpful in your centre, I'm thinking that many of many of the things I'm going to talk about next is not going to be new to you. But what I would love for you to think about is that this endorses the great work you are already doing. OK, and just stresses the importance of the things you are already doing and we need to see more of it. And I, I thank you for doing what you are doing. OK, so. Little, a little profile. This might be done by the by the in, by the student by the little person themselves. They might draw some pictures of themselves. They might draw some pictures of their family. They might get mum or dad to just write what things they're great at. You can have a little booklet all about me, which might be a nice thing to bring to those um, first days of kindy or first days of being in prep. Um, just thinking about our strengths. What do our kids love? What are their interests? So we know that we can incorporate that into our day and that makes our day much more fun because we are engaged in the topic and it's all something that I love. Um, thinking about transition skills, thinking about a, trans, a sensory profile. Uh, Linda has um, in, her, in a pack that she's going to send through to you. There are some conversation cards. They may be helpful. You may already be using them, but a conversation card um, when a person says, oh my, my little one, when a parent says my little person doesn't really like hanging out with other kids. The next step is then giving you some um, some questions to ask that will dig a little bit deeper into that. Oh, tell me about that. So why do you think that they, you know, so you can find some more information out um, before you meet the little person. So it can be really helpful. Um, the more we know about our little people, um, the more we're able to connect with them and connection and relationships are really what make the world go round. Let's face it. OK, so just thinking about this, know how the learners learn. And again, you know, we are all, a long way through the year. I'm very confident you are you are thinking about these things already. But just looking at that slide, you know, who are our kids who need those rules? You know, they're the little policemen that say you can't go up the slide that way. You have to hop at the top and slide down. You know, they're the little people who are running around the playground trying to help you sort out these reckless kids who aren't playing right. So how do we how do we help that little person move to a calm space? You know, how do we reassure them in that space so that they can have some downtime and just be a kid and enjoy? How do we reassure? Um, so just knowing about those things, hands on our little hands on learners. Um, early early education centers are just the bomb for our hands on learners and our creative, imaginative kids. But perhaps they are not so for our little ones who are rule based. Perhaps the sensory overload may be too difficult for some of those kids. So just thinking about those things in our environment and how we can um, create spaces that work for everybody and celebrates diversity. Um, so again, just a slide to think about the interests. How do we create a, a structured environment? How are we going to clearly define tasks and expectations? And how do we adapt the environment to cater for the needs of our little people and the, who are accessing it? And that might be how do we look at, look at our environment through an autism lens. Um, we do know, for example, um, many of our classes or many of our spaces are very busy. We've got lots of amazing work hanging from the string across the classroom and our walls are covered with lots of beautiful, amazing things and that's really exciting and a great place to go. I love going into those spaces. I find it invigorating, but for a little one who finds it really difficult to process sensory, visual senses, that might be really her. Uh, they might be a little bit scary for them. So just thinking about how we can incorporate those things. It might be that you have a sheet that you pull down over the wall during times when you're doing some focused, focused work. Um, it might be that you just have a few things hanging on the string across the, across the um, room. Okay. So moving forward, focusing on our strengths and why is it important? I know this is a, a little bit of a no-brainer because all those things there, you are you are nodding as you see, as you read them. Um, why do we focus on strengths? Because it's really important to focus on strengths. And sometimes it's hard for us to focus on strengths because with our little people who challenge us, it might be a little bit tricky for us to find some of them. But we do know, research tells us, that the, the more time we spend connecting with our kids, it makes us feel better and it is really important for our students. Okay, it is about well-being and promoting that in our session and thinking about how we can continue to, to do that and grow and change. Um, our little ones who challenge us most, most are from those ones who are seeking connection with us but are not sure how to do it in an appropriate way. So while we are making sure we co-regulate with them rather than co-escalate, we can encourage them to um, seek, seek connections with us in ways that are, are more enjoyable for them and for us and just thinking about how we can continue to build on that relationship. 
Um, just speaking about our environments, you have this in your pack, but again, this is from the Autism Hub website. This is an environmental audit. Um, you have a different one. So this is directly from the Autism Hub. Linda has one that is different, but it is an environmental audit. So this is just an inc just encouraging you to think about things that are happening in your space, both inside and outside your centres, and just thinking about things that we might need to just, oh, is that, you know, that fluorescent light's been clickering for weeks and I have to tell the janitor to come and fix it and I keep forgetting. That might be really difficult for a little person who is who has autism. That might be very um, disconcerting for them. I know it's annoying for me, but I can filter it out if I have a flickering light. But for, for many of our little kids, they can't, they don't, aren't able to do that. But I'm a grown up with lots of experience in how to filter things out. So just thinking about those things can also be helpful. The, the audit um, environment or environmental audit might be something that you'd like to look at, particularly as we transition from term four into the beginning of the year. Maybe when we're setting up our classrooms for the beginning of the year, what, what will our classroom audit tell us? Um, uh, are, are all our desks in a great space so that the kids can see the whiteboard? Is the person sitting in that seat over there experiencing glare because they're near the window? Can they see the whiteboard? When we have um, sitting time in front of the chair and doing morning routine, there might be a number of our kids who find it really hard. They don't have the core strength to sit cross-legged for extended periods of time. So what sorts of things can we do for those little people to enable them to be able to sit and relax and engage? We might have a little egg chair or a floor chair for them. Um, if you have access to an OT, talk to an OT about some of those things. Um, it's um, usually a great idea if we can get an OT to come and do some PD on our student pre days at the beginning of the year to just talk about some of those things and that might help us um, better prepare for our uh, new little people who are coming into our place, into our spaces. So video modelling, I just wanted to give you a little bit of information about that. Um, video modelling is... Um, um, going to click on this and hope it works. So I will talk to you after this is finished. I hope we've got sound. I'm not sure, Will. Um, <clears throat> I can see you, Tina, if you want to give me a thumbs up after we press play. Thank you. Okay. Um, and let me know if you can hear. <laughs> All eyes are on Tina. And then exit, let's just escape. Oh, intro? No. Yep. Yeah. And then um, we'll just teams. teams and reshare with sound. And we're back to here. Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, Tina, we're watching you again. I think we will all have sound now. Take two.
Okay. Thank you for that. So video modeling is a little bit groovy. Um, I I guess my example of video modeling um, I saw in a school in Mackay, it was a early prep year, so early in the year, and the teacher had actually filmed the little the, the class sitting on the carpet, standing up, walking outside, getting their a fruit break, opening their lunch boxes, sitting down and eating their fruit. So what she did every day well, she sat the kids in front of her whiteboard and she played that clip for them and then they were able to follow that. What the teacher did in that time was offered praise and prompts throughout. So it wasn't, stand over here, come and pick, oh, you've lost your lunchbox. It was great work. Well done, oh, great waiting. So lots of beautiful, beautiful prompts and reinforcement for those behaviours. So it was very exciting to see that. Um, uh, so video modelling, I think, is something that uh, we could consider. I know we are often time poor in many spaces. If you are in a school and you have a bunch of year six kids who are doing media, they might be some of the people who you might like to um, engage in, in doing some video modelling for you if, if that was appropriate. Um, I, of course, I am aware of photographic permissions and being mindful that we are not breaching any of those things, but it can be a very... Um, a really great way of assisting our young people to get used to or learn new skills. Um, also great if we have a chance, you know, to, particularly in school settings, to film things like sports day, swimming carnivals, parade, so kids can practice doing those things um, before they actually need to do them. Um, the Autism Hub, if you are keen to check that out, also has a virtual visit where we have first person's perspective walking from a car through the school to a classroom. Um, the idea is that the little person watches that several times as they are driving to school and once they arrive, they are they know exactly where they need to go. Um, so just teaching, uh, talking about teaching self-regulation, we know for our little ones who are in our centres, self-regulation is often really hard. It's even hard for grown-ups sometimes, I have to say, when I'm walking past the chocolate section <laughs> in the coals. Um, but anyway... Uh, Autism CRC was one of the logos that you saw endorsed on a, on a slide previously. They do a, a significant amount of research in the area of autism and they have, a, I guess, a side, a side line to this, which is Inclusion Ed. Um, it is a great website as well. They have lots of modules on there for lots of different things. I've just got two examples here that focus particularly, uh, specifically on modelling emotional literacy and teaching self-regulation. Wonderful for our, for our little people. Um, if you log on to and register on Inclusion Ed, you are then invited, to, you can participate in the blogs and um, there are people in the inclusion ed space who will reply to you so it can be a two-way conversation around any questions that you have or any concerns so you will get feedback when you complete a module you will get a certificate of completion so that also feeds into your um, professional development as well um, these two uh, modules were developed as a result of research that was conducted by Beth Saggers um, and it was about inclusive education settings for early years in rural and remote locations the exciting part about this um, is I believe that the research um, Bersica Street State School in Rocky participated in that research. So it's really exciting to see um, action research that has come back to us now and that we can see it through modules because it's based on evidence from our, our kids in our schools. I think I need to hurry up, so I'm just going to move through. Um, we do know that transitions can be a little bit tricky at times. We know that visual schedules can assist in that space. Um, this And this is just another, I guess, just another graphic to think about ways that we can help kids move from one space to another. Using a visual schedule like first and then, um, and we know ritual and routine is great. Sometimes using a transition object, so it might be, oh, it's story time now. So would you carry the book over to my chair? So the little one can pick up the book, move across to the chair and be ready. So in that moment, they're, they're shifting their headspace from one thing to another, uh, um, asking them for, to help you. I'm um, thinking about a favourite activity that might be in there. You know, you might like to do a little dance before we move on to the next section. Um, but just some ideas. I'm sure that you would have a million as well if we asked you to pop them in your chat box. But just thinking about that just uh, helps our little people move from one section to another. Visual supports. I know that I know I talk ad nauseum. Anyone who knows me well, will be, oh, yeah, here she is, rabbiting on about visuals again. We do know they work. I have to say when I am often um, have a conversation with people who say, oh, we, well, we don't give them visuals because they can speak really well, so they actually don't need visuals. And I say, well, we speak really well as well, but our, our iPhones 
uh, full of visuals. So what's that? Um, so it just encourages us to think about some different ways. It's, it allows kids to not have to process so many words. We can see a visual, we've got the context, we know what it means, away we go. Save lots of time. I heard a really beautiful story yesterday at um, Gladstone West when we were participating in our early years. Um, one of the teachers there who teaches prep had her, her, visual, her lanyard of visuals on the hanging on the whiteboard and these two little kids in the class were fighting. So one little, well, not a fighting, but arguing. So one little boy wanted the toy that the other one had and the other one wasn't about to give it up. So this little kid took the friend who had the toy over to the lanyard, found the, found the visual for sharing and said, look, sharing, sharing, we need to do that. So I thought that, that was pretty cool. So these are just some examples of visuals. The one you see on the left that I've just popped up is probably a little bit too busy for our little people. Um, but, you know, I guess if we make approximations of that, the one, the image at the bottom is probably um, more better suited to a younger grade. The other visual that I've just popped up, I really like, and this might be really great for our younger classes, particularly when we've got no-go zones, no-go zones or areas that aren't okay for little people to go to because something's happened, like a water main has burst. So it just gives us an idea of where we can go and where we can't go. Um, thinking about communication and thinking about your modes of communication and the learning styles of, of what we are saying and doing in our spaces. Your um, body language and your voice are also um, communicating different, different ways of being and thinking about how um, we might be able to use other modes, such as puppets or visuals or social stories or video modelling. Um, supporting communication, there we go with visuals again. These are just some different things that you might be able to incorporate in your day if you are not already. Um, just think, and if you are, think about some of the ones that you aren't but you'd like to try. If you are looking at things like social narratives or video modelling, again, I would encourage you to go back to Affirm and have a look. There is a uh, module in there that will show you how to implement that. Um, I guess just thinking about this is probably the most powerful evidence-based practice of all is non-contingent positive, positive attention. And this is about connecting with those little people just because you are sharing the same space with them and you are loving it. It is about saying that they look pretty cool today, that they've got the best sand shoes you've ever seen and the most grooviest backpack on their back. It is about just touching bases with them and spending time with them. It is not about anything that they have done or that they, anything that they have completed, it's just about touching bases and building a relationship with them. So just thinking about that, and if you are, well, you would be doing that in your day, thank you and congratulations, because that is a really, really important thing to do. Okay. Um, and finally, our parents. I, we need to give our nod to our parents. They are often the movers and shakers who get things happening for our kids. Um, there have been many times when... Um, I've heard stories from parents who say, you know, I've, I've, asked the, I've asked the doctor so many times and they just say, no, there's nothing, there's nothing. Um, they are the first educators of our kids and generally the first who notice that something is different. Um, and sometimes they haven't been treated very well by our professionals. I'm not saying our educators, I'm talking more about our medical staff. So just know that every parent has been a journey, particularly a parent of a little one with autism. And I think it's also important to know that you are the first person, the first um, formal person that they may connect with other than medical staff and that you have a really important role to play in their journey. Um, we know some parents can be tricky. There's a reason for that. So just, I guess, build understanding, build relationships and continue to support them in whatever way you can. I guess thinking more broadly in our world of autism, it is the parents of our kids with autism who have been the movers and shakers on an international scale and they are the ones who have got education for our, for our kids and they are the ones who have gotten rid of segregated settings and they are the ones who continue to advocate for change and they will continue to do that. So that makes our world a better space. Um, you have this with your pack. Um, this comes from Positive Partnerships. It is set of, a set of commitment cards and they are beautiful. Um, I just thought as a setting or as a centre, you might like to sit with your team and just say, what do we want to commit to and what do we want to commit to with our family? I've just clipped a few um, uh, examples there that I think are beautiful and it might just help us realign. You know, we've had a crappy day and the world, we think the world is not going well for us. Maybe it's time then to just revisit our commitment cards and um, let us know why we're there and, and why we continue to come back. 
Um, what I would love to do now, this is the last slide, and thank you all for sticking with me. I know I'm way over and I do apologise. So this is the last um, slide or the last clip that I would love to share with you this afternoon. Um, I guess for me, I've had the privilege of working in the area of special education for a really long time, and I have had the great privilege of working from birth, so from little babies with of, of little, not particularly autism, but from little ones right through to those big burly high school high school kids who when I first went there I thought oh my goodness they're so tall what am I going to do here so right through I, I I know I've worked with little ones all the way through so I guess for those of you who are with with our mums and dads at the beginning of the journey please know that you you pave the way for those who come after you and we thank you for that Sorry, oh, I'm going to get a little bit teary now because we do appreciate what you do and the time you spend with your kids. And we don't get it right all the time, but we will continue to try. So what I would love for you to see is the end result of some of the work that you people have done back in the day. And this is a group of amazing high school kids. All of them have autism and this is their story. Um, so I will be quiet and let you listen to this. Tina, can you hear that? Well, I think everyone should just understand that autism isn't actually a disability. Like, it's just, I guess, an alternative to how people live life. Like, people look at it as a disability, but it's just people grow up a different way, people function a different way, and it's just adapting to that and getting used to it. I'll always be friendly to you if you come up and say hi. I like that with autism that um, we're able to learn in different ways that not many other people are able to sometimes. It's not bad. Mostly I like hanging out with my friends. I guess it's important to remember that autism can take like any form, right? Like it can be me and most people don't even cue that I have ASD. Like anybody you see on the street, you don't know they could have ASD. Like sometimes it's more obvious. A very, very large amount of people, like not everybody, but like a, quite a significant amount have an implicit bias towards people with disabilities. And you know, you're conquered in an implicit bias when you don't feel like you need to change your behavior around somebody or it doesn't make you uncomfortable somehow. Once you've acknowledged it, you'll be able to understand it better and then work through it. And then maybe you'll be able to look at somebody with ASD in the eye properly. And maybe they won't look you back in the eye because sometimes you have a problem with eye contact. But you know, you get the idea. If there is someone with autism, just try and look at how they do things, try and learn how you can adapt to that and help them out the best. Like, you know, just try and communicate in ways that make them feel more welcome. The thing is, every challenge with autism is something that you can train and every strong point with autism is something you can train to do better. Thinking outside the box, um, have other skills that non-autistic people don't have. Um, seeing the world differently, seeing it in a clever way and just being different, like it's, it's, I think I'd, I would describe autism as tough, but unique. And it's a very happy thing as well to like see what it's like to, to be in this on this planet and what, what life is like behind, all behind it. It's crazy, but cool. Okay, so that is it for me. Um, thank you all so much. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. Sorry, Linda. No, you're right. Right, sorry. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. And then it's that one. And then I'll be able to see it properly. Okay. So I, just, I did have a few slides just about saying goodbye and any questions oh. or comments. So, no, no, that's all right. <laughs> So thank you, everybody. Um, so I, I guess, yeah, the last the last um, little clip I think is just just says so much. So those those beautiful beautiful people were, um, yeah, they were little people in early childhood settings. So we have wow, lots of time. Wow, lovely video, and another comment. Love, love, love that video. <laughs> so go onto the autism hub. Spend some time in that space. I am sure that you will find things in there that you may able to be able to show your parents. I've also put a clip, um, there's a beautiful, was a beautiful um, 
a uh, little mini documentary done by the ABC, I think, a few years ago called Dads, um, Dads of Kids with Autism, and it is wonderful as well, and you have that. Mm. And I promise you I will um, find the clip that I was trying to find you of the of um, the, the app, um, just so you can see to, to um, just the range of differences between little ones in their development. Do you have any questions or comments? I do apologise for going over. I'm really sorry. And I'm also really sorry and a little bit embarrassed about my technical skills. So sorry about that too. <laughs> I was really <laughs> helped, don't you worry. <laughs> okay, so I'm just looking at who we have. See if there's anyone I can pick on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, we have... Um... It we have early yeah. childhood. Yeah, okay, wonderful. We do have some early childhood services. We have some schools. We have some. I believe I can see a family daycare. Cool. Yeah. Um, I'm here. <laughs> Get me to come with Linda. I'd love to come and visit your centre. And really, if there are things that you need or things that you were wondering about, just ask us. Like there are there are lots of things that we can do to support you in that space, and we would really love that. Yes. Yes, Christy. Damn it. I did. I had it this morning, and I've cl I closed down the site, so of course okay, you can't find it when you need it. So I'm really sorry about that. Sarah, did you have something, or are you just showing us joining us? No, I just thought I'd show my face at some stage. Yeah, thank you. We appreciate that. Thank you, Ron. That was a great presentation. Wonderful. Thank you. Glad you liked it. And do feel free. I, I have asked Marie to to be available to answer your questions. I don't know if you might be like me. I call myself a marinator. I do need time to digest the information, and then later on, I think of the awesome questions. So do that. Um, you have my contact details, and Marie's happy to. I've asked her for the month of September to be available for you, but I'm sure she's um, always available and beyond that as well. So we we are here, and uh, any time that we can help, let us know. Thank you, everybody. Go well. Thank you. Enjoy your breaks, your upcoming breaks, if you've got some holidays coming up. Wonderful. Thanks, Carmen. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Oh, the packs. I will email the packs tomorrow. Um, I will not do it now because I'm going to leave work. <laughs> but I will tomorrow. I will send you an evaluation form and I will send you all of the resources that and links that Marie has provided. So. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Crystal. Thanks, Carmen. Bye, thank you. Bye. Marie, how do I spell your last name? Dwyer, D W Y E R. D W Y E R. Yeah. Was, yeah, that's what I thought. I just want to check. You know, people have different spellings. And Marie, M A R W E. Yep, yep, perfect. It was good. I enjoyed that. Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm.
It'd be good if you was. Oh yes, yeah. That person must have logged in a minute. So are you still recording? So go more because why is that red? Stop recording. Okay, stop recording and transcription. Yes.